started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brianna Martin, and I'm the Senior Marketing and Events Manager at Mighty Citizen. Uh, we're here today to talk about the anatomy of a nonprofit website, why your donors aren't giving more online. I want to thank all of you for attending, and before I introduce our speakers, go over just a few housekeeping items. Uh, this is a very robust presentation. We should have a few minutes at the end for some questions. If you do have any questions during the webinar, uh, just to ensure that they're not missed, we ask that you please post them in the question area of the Zoom as opposed to the chat, uh, because there might be some chatter back and forth and it'll be easier to manage that way. Uh, and then lastly, uh, just as a reminder, the slides, a link to the recording, and then a few other goodies will be sent to each of you in the next few days. So no pressure to take any notes. Um, so I'm really excited today to introduce our speakers. We have Nick Miller, Director of Experience at Fundraise Up, and then our own Rachel Clemens, Mighty Citizens Chief Marketing Officer, who will be leading the webinar today. So Rachel, the mic is all yours. All right. Thanks for joining us today, everybody, and for your weather reports. Um, we know that websites are just one part of your marketing, communications, and fundraising mix, but I would argue that they're, they're the most important part. In fact, we have a saying here that they are your best development people, your best fundraisers, because they work 24-7, they only say what you want them to say. There's lots of reasons that your website should be bringing in a lot of money for you. So today we're going to talk about how we can use our brains to set up a great online strategy tap into our donors' hearts to make them care, and then keep it all moving with an optimized online giving experience. So we'll be looking at a mixture of compelling content, thoughtful user experience, and conversion tactics to make sure that in the end, you can raise more money, because that's what we're really here to help you guys do today. I'm Rachel Clemens. I'm the CMO at Mighty Citizen. If you're not familiar with Mighty Citizen, we're the branding, marketing, and digital agency for nonprofits. Um, that means we help our clients increase their revenue, boost awareness, and better their communities. And we do that primarily through messaging, campaign work, fundraising, websites, online marketing, anything and everything connected to uh, communications. And I'm joined today by Nick. Nick, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much, Rachel and Brianna. It's a pleasure to join you and the Mighty Citizen team. I am hailing from New York City today, and I see that we have some others joining from the city as well for the webinar. I am the Director of Experience here at Fundraise Up. We are a financial technology company dedicated to providing nonprofits with AI-powered donation technology to help them raise more money so that they can do more out in the world. Great. So by the end of the session today, you're going to know how to establish goals and strategize solutions for your website. So basically a step-by-step -step process for creating a better website. We'll talk about developing compelling content, things that will actually make people care, uh, understanding what makes for a better user experience. I'm going to share a lot of great examples with you guys. I don't know about y'all, but I learn best when I can see. I'm a visual learner, I guess. I can see what someone else is doing and learn from it. So I will be sharing those today and then making quick website fixes that result in immediate improvements for you guys, all in an effort to raise more money, again, while we're here. First, I wanna start with some numbers about why we're talking specifically about online fundraising. Uh, we know that online fundraising continues to be on the rise. This is a stat or some figures from BlackBod's charitable giving report. Um, and you can see how online giving has increased over the years. And certainly in 2020, we saw it take a big jump uh, more so than it had even over previous years. Um, now, it's only 13% on average from the people that they surveyed and talked to. We know that some organizations will see 20%, 30% um, of their revenue come in from online giving. And the rest of it, a lot of it is just major gifts. Like people aren't cutting huge amounts of uh, donations right there online. Uh, mobile giving is also on the rise. And so you can see this of online giving, 28% of that comes from people's mobile phones. So it's really important that your mobile experience is as optimized as possible. Um, and make sure you're looking at this for your organization. You may see that over 50% of your donations come from mobile, especially if you're on like doing a lot of social campaigns or you have a lot of um, peer to peer type giving, then you'll see your mobile be higher. Nick, I think you had a stat on mobile giving. Yes, absolutely. And through our own research, we found that nonprofits that are using Fundraise Up, their 
seeing donors on mobile give about 48%, they're occupying 48% of online digital revenue. So it's a huge, significant chunk of revenue coming from people who are giving through their phones or other mobile devices. Yeah, and we'll just expect that to keep growing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to share a quick experiment that I did a, a couple years ago with a colleague uh, around nonprofit uh, online giving. And so we went to 10 different random websites. We were speaking at a conference, but picked 10 nonprofits at random, went and donated a small amount on each of their sites and just kind of looked to see what we were getting. So there's a few places that nonprofits in general are winning when it comes to online giving. One is mobile. We're collecting donations on mobile. Um, we all have our sites mobile optimi optimized now. Thank you for that. Um, but it's not always as easy of an experience to give on mobile as it is to give on a desktop or a laptop. We are sharing why we exist. Um, this is really important. We're going to dive more into this later, but making sure it's really clear at the outset when a user visits our site, uh, why we matter, what our mission is, and why our mission matters. We're talking or we're offering sustaining options for donations. So making sure that we are offering monthly donation options. Uh, we're seeing, you know, I always think of it like the generation, I'm Gen uh, X, uh, the generation probably below me. And of course the Gen Zs, they're used to the subscription model. You can't get your TV now. You can't get your good radio or, any, or you know, audio now without a subscription. So they're used to paying monthly for things. Um, so let's tap into that and definitely offer up our monthly options. And then we're also offering donation amounts. Um, so for most websites, we are offering multiple donation amounts. And um, you'll see this example for Feeding America here on the right. They're, this is a mobile view of their site and they're doing a great job with their donation form. So if you're looking for an example, especially from a mobile perspective donation form, go check out Feeding America. Where we're not doing so great or where we might be struggling a little bit is some of us are still asking people to create accounts in order to donate. Now, if this is you, the chances are that if, if you're facing that, it's because you're part of some larger, larger organization, maybe you're part of a university. There's all kinds of reasons that um, people have to create, uh, create accounts in order to donate to you, but do your very, very best to get off of the system because nobody wants to create that account. Nudges, we're gonna go into these in detail as well, but there are a few psychological things you can do to help further your fundraising. Uh, certainly we'll be looking at that and Nick knows a lot about that as well with the AI and um, fundraise up. Segmentation, we're not always collecting data about our users. I'm gonna give you a great tip for um, how to get this information without being annoying, you know, uh, and to make sure that you're not impeding the donation process by collecting this information. Um, but we're, we need to do a better job of making sure we understand what segments and personas that our audiences fall into so we can create content that's specific to them and the things or programs they care about. And then thank you pages. We are not taking advantage of our thank you pages. Again, we'll go into this in more detail. Most of the time they look like receipts and they shouldn't. This is a great opportunity to share a celebration with your donor. This is when they feel at their best about giving to you. So we wanna make sure that we um, give them good experience. By the way, this image is showing um, a nonprofit that shall not be named and their, um, their mobile experience. So some of us still have that little pinch and zoom we used to all have to do. Uh, make sure that is not the case for your organization. Okay, starting with strategy. So every great website starts with strategy. Whether or not you hire a web firm or do it yourself, you have to start with this part of the process. You can't kind of skip over strategy and go straight to design or go straight to content because those things without strategy are not based in anything valuable. Um, so what is strategy? Strategy is the making of an integrated set of choices. It requires answers to a set of questions. So strategy is then captured in a written action plan that states how you'll achieve your strategy and how you'll measure your results. So ultimately, the strategy for your organization needs to be written down. Um, and there's be a series of, um, of steps for that. So I'll walk you through that. First thing you want to do is you want to start with your goals for your website. 
What are you trying to accomplish with your site? What's the number one thing that you want your audiences to do? Now, I know from you know working with nonprofits for many years that there's a lot of things you want your audiences to do. So you have got to prioritize them and make sure you have one leading thing you want your audience to do. For a lot of you, that is donate. It's to raise money. Um, whatever that number one priority is for your uh, the goal of your site, make sure that that is your primary call to action. So on your site, make sure that is the thing that they are definitely going to see. They may see other calls to action as well, but that is the primary. And we're going to, I'm going to show you some examples of this in a minute. Get early buy-in from all of your stakeholders. Um, if you may not be, you may or may not be the one that is in charge of your website. A lot of you, if you're on the development team, you've got a communications team that's probably in charge of the website, um, unless they're under one department. So make sure that you are bringing your needs to your marketing team or your comms team. Make sure that everyone that has a say in the website is getting in on the goal conversation. If you leave someone out and then like, you know, four months into a website project, they pop up and say, well, I need this from the site. Well, that means you didn't do something right, you know, in those first 30 days. You've got to make sure you're talking to everybody that needs to have a say in the website. This is also like your events people and um, your program teams, uh, client managers, things like that. Document your goals and how you'll measure them. Again, not worth having a goal unless it is written down and you say how you will know you have succeeded. So for some of you, if it's fundraising, you want to say um, our number one goal is to bring in more money. We want to bring 10% more money online than we did last year or whatever that looks like. Awareness as a goal. If the job of your website is to raise awareness, that happens off of your site. Typically, your website is not the place to raise awareness. Your website is the place people come to from your awareness building channels. So for example, you might be running ads, Google ads, um, digital marketing, you've got some SEO, search engine optimization. Those are activities that drive new people and awareness to your site. Your site isn't a build it and they will come. You have to drive people there. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Awareness can be a goal. We don't want to increase our brand awareness or awareness about certain programs. But if awareness is your number one goal, that does not actually happen on your website. Uh, and if awareness is your number one goal, ask yourself, we want to drive awareness so that blank can happen. Like, what is the point of driving awareness? Is it to raise more money? Is it to get more volunteers? You know, what does that look like? So I'm going to show you guys a few websites and I want you to just pop in the chat what you think the number one goal of the site is and just take a quick glance. You should kind of get it right away. All right, here's our first one. Casa, Travis County. I see some things coming in. Volunteer. Yes. So you'll notice um, and I hope you all can see. Yeah, you can see that. So at the top right, you see donate and volunteer are both up there together. They have pretty equal footing but the uh, header section also has a volunteer call out. So it's very clear, right? That that's their number one agenda. How about this one? Okay, yep, give dough, donate. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> very clear. By the way, ASPCA is another great example of people that make their calls to action very clear. What I love about this site is everything's pretty muted. I mean, of course, there's a beautiful dog, but notice that the, um, donate buttons really pop. Those oranges are popping out compared to everything else on the site. And that's a design nudge or technique to help people, you know, to make those donation buttons stand out. Okay, here's a little bit of a different one. See what you guys think about this. Buy tickets. Yep, ride the boat. Right, so this is the National World War II Museum. Their thing is about selling experiences, whether that's you know a certain excursion or tickets. Um, so theirs is a little bit different. So no matter what your organization is, you know what your priority is, you can see these are all three different things from different nonprofits, um, but they've all done a great job of really making that clear. And again, notice the color here that the red items are in the logo and the calls to action. Just like you have to have a clear uh, goal for your overall website, you have to have a clear goal for each page of your website. Now, if you are an organization that has 300 pages, do not kill yourself. Uh, get in there and look at your most trafficked pages. Use your Google Analytics to see where audiences are coming most or those pages that you know should have top priority, like your donation page, 
I'm going to give you an example of an organization um, in a minute here that has like uh, memberships. And so we'll walk through that. So um, again, what are you trying to accomplish with each page of your site? That becomes your call to action for that particular page. You can have different calls to action throughout your site for different sections of your site, and that would be normal. Again, be sure to speak with the owners of the section that you are um, setting goals for. So again, if you have an events team, if you're lucky enough to have an events team, um, make sure that they're giving you input on what the goals of the events section of your site should be. So here's an example of what this might look like. So for example, you know, on this nonprofit, they've got a membership um, play, and so they have a join page. The purpose of that page is to make the case for membership. The ideal user action or call to action is to sign up to become a member. And then the audience are general prospects. So you see you create a little um, spreadsheet. I'm going to give you a link for that here in a minute. Um, you create a spreadsheet and you just outline each of these, the purpose, the action, and the audience for each one to make sure it's doing what it should be doing for you. Another example is their advocacy page. They want to showcase their advocacy work. That's the purpose. They want to um, drive users to learn more about their advocacy issues and their audiences are members and general prospects. Again, you can have multiple audiences. Just make sure that you're listing them in priority order. Yeah, and I see Bree has shared a link to our template for something like this. It has a lot more stuff in it, um, but you can, you know, expand it or contract it as it makes sense for your organization. Um, for them, they have an education section. Uh, they want to feature available professional development programs. Uh, they want people to review all the options available to them, again, for members and general prospects. And then as you drive into individual educations, uh, education pieces, they want people to sign up for an event. So if that makes sense. Again, that website content audit Brie has shared in the chat, or you can go search for that at myassistant.com slash insights. When you're building out your site, remember that you have lots of users to, con uh, to consider. And when I say building out your site, you may be updating your site, right? Not all of us are able to go through a full redesign. But think about who your users are, and they're always different. Nonprofits, yeah, I mean, y'all have a hard, hard job. You got a million audiences, but some of the popular ones are donors, volunteers, you've got clients, partners. Um, I often think of like leadership uh, out in the community, new users for your site, returning users for your site. Think about how each one of them will come to your site and how they'll discover you. And Nick, I know y'all have some great statistics on especially recurring donors and visitors. Yes, absolutely. And there is a connection between people who give on a recurring basis to your nonprofit and people who visit your website multiple times. And there is, in fact, some very interesting data about people who arrive on your website and become recurring donors. And what we have found as a company is that this segment of your donor base is potentially the most important, even beyond your legacy donors, for example because these donors are those that are providing you with support. But what's great about that is this is going to, of course, have a positive impact on donor retention. It's gonna have a positive impact on the lifetime value of any given donor. And then some fun quick facts about these recurring donors is that these donors who say cover transaction costs the first time they give, are likely to continue doing that in the future. And donors who are recurring donors are likely to increase the size of their gifts from that first gift to the second gift and beyond. So there's a lot of positive numbers. There are, there's positive numbers to be pulled from this particular um, subset of users on your website. Great. Um, so when you're thinking about new people visiting your site and then those returning donors and users that Nick mentioned, just think about how you're gonna bring them to the site, all the different ways they'll discover you. We mentioned search engine optimization, which is making sure you're using certain keywords on your site to make sure that people can find you easily, um, or maybe a social ads or social post. And then also think about how you'll keep users returning. So what are you offering them um, that's important to them on an ongoing basis? Uh, one way to think about this is through the idea of a, of a user journey. Um, and so this is the idea of, you know, sort of the marketing funnel. Any of you familiar with marketing communications have seen the marketing funnel before, and this is sort of like that, 
the idea is that when people um, first visit your site, what is there of interest to them? So for new people, maybe you've brought them in just from, you know, visiting your website, maybe they saw you out in the world in some non-digital way. Um, when they get to your site, what is there for them to do? They haven't been nurtured yet, so they may not be ready to donate, but there may be something they clearly care about your mission because they came to your site. So is there a petition there for them to sign up um, and, and show their support for? Is there a newsletter that they can sign up for? What's an easy way in that they can sort of raise their hand and say, I'm with you without having to yet donate? Next, you wanna think about consideration. This is the nurturing phase. So are there, what are the consistent touches you can give them? Impact stories on your site, news, advocacy issues. These are the kind of things that often show up in like your email marketing or your newsletters. Um, so it's the things that drive them back to the site and keep them coming back as you're nurturing them. Next stage is involvement. What's the step they take to actually get involved? That's the donation um, phase. It can also be volunteering. It can be membership, whatever that looks like for your organization. The involvement stage is well, when you've done the work of nurturing them and they've not only raised their hand, but given you know, either time or treasure. And then lastly, advocacy. Um, taking them a step further once they've donated and really turning them into advocates for your organization, sharing on social, campaigning for you, doing peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, whatever they might look like in your organization. Keep in mind that, you know, um, you've got new users coming through this. You've also got returning users coming through this, and those things should be thought about throughout. There's lots of ways to, um, I'll say cross-sale or like cross Donate isn't really a phrase, but get them going up and down over and over again, right? Just because someone has donated doesn't mean they can't still go and sign a petition. Whatever you do, make sure your users can navigate your site with ease. This is called cognitive ease. It basically means your brain doesn't, you know, to keep it simple, stupid, your brain doesn't have to think too much about what it's doing. We want to give people visual cues that make it really easy to, for them to find what they're trying to do and to actually act on it. Um, success or failure in this department depends on the ease with which visitors can navigate your site. So again, when I showed you those um, at the ASPCA site and they've got those nice big orange buttons and they draw your attention, that is navigating with ease. If a user wants to donate, they know exactly how to do it. And your job as the person potentially in charge of your website is to sacrifice for the greater good. I cannot emphasize this enough. You know this already, but everyone in your organization wants real estate on the website. They know the power of the website. It's a hot commodity and they want their real estate and they are going to advocate for that. And you have got to remind them that when you all sat down and set your goals, that your number one goal was, for example, fundraising. And if your thing that you're asking for on the homepage does not lead to fundraising, it belongs somewhere else because that's our number one goal. Okay, that's hard to do. And then make your journey pathways clear. Those things we just looked at where we were leading people down different steps, make sure those are really clear for them and show up um, where they should be in appropriate places. This is an example of a site that does not have cognitive ease. Um, yeah, I mean, you get it, right? Your eye jumps everywhere. There's a million colors, a million things you could be doing. Lots of call out. I, I couldn't even tell you where to begin. Um, so yeah, yikes is right. It's it's bad. A couple other things on generally when you think about strategy, search engine optimization is a must. Again, in simplest forms, SEO are the keywords that people use, is optimizing your site for the words people use to search for organizations like yours. Um, it's essential that you think about SEO as it relates to your website and understand what keywords people are searching for. There's lots of tools that help you do this and make sure that you're writing content that is um, answering the questions that people have and that they ask search engines. It's best to plan for this in the strategy phase. You can go back and add SEO to your site letter, but it can be much more difficult to do. This involves keyword research, um, selecting the keywords that people are likely to search for to find you, and then writing content that answers their questions. That's the most important part. This is a, we could spend a whole hour on SEO if you're feeling a little like, uh, I recommend a resource called moz.com. Um, they do a great job of sort of getting you started. So. 
And then accessibility is a must as well. So um, 60 million people in the US have a disability. Accessibility on your website ensures that regardless of their ability, they are able to use your site in a friendly way. This means making sure that you've got screen readers, that people using screen readers can access your site and use it appropriately. It means that that means that you have thoughtful page structure. So this is where the development of your site really matters. Um, if you are an organization that receives federal funding, make sure, or state funding, make sure that your site is accessible. You are absolutely required to do that. That means making sure that you have alt tags for all of your images in case they can't see the images that tell them what they're missing and that you have visual contrast on your site. So making sure that you know text stands out and is easily read for those with vision impairment. Again, could spend a whole hour on this, um, but there, and there's a lot to it and it's absolutely important. It's not just good for business, but it's the right thing to do, right? Uh, we do have a... Um, uh, resource Brianna is sharing it in the chat that's all about accessibility for mission driven organizations and Nick you had some anecdotes about this just to hit yeah. it home yes and this is an area that maybe hasn't traditionally been at the forefront of nonprofits minds as they consider redeveloping their websites but it's certainly important and as Rachel said if you're receiving federal or state funds or local funds there's oftentimes requirements for you to have these accessibility features built into your platform. And it's certainly something that we as a company at Fundraise Up have encountered in the past where we've had to make improvements to our platform to make sure that it is accessible to everyone. And a, a good analog for this is to think of the constructed world. And as we have environments that you know need to have ramps to enter buildings and other features to help people, um, the same is true of your website. It is a built environment and it structurally needs to have things like alt tags or what are known as ARIA tags built into the very code of the site so that technology, assistive technology such as screen readers can detect what a certain element is on your website and describe it back to the user. Yep, really very important. Okay, so we talked about um, leading with strategy and, and our brains, and now we're gonna talk about letting the heart lead. Um, the decision for people to engage with a nonprofit is always an emotional decision. So we wanna make sure they know why they should care. So when they visit our site, we wanna make sure we have a mission-centric message woven into our website's DNA. Uh, they don't give to your organization, they give to your outcomes. So make absolutely sure that, that, that they understand what you're trying to accomplish. Again, think of all the different ways your users will discover you. A lot of times your users do not come to your site via your homepage. In fact, for us, 20% of our audience comes through our homepage first. 80% do not, they come to an article or something else. So just keep that in mind. You can look at your own analytics to see how you shape up there, but just know they may not come in through your homepage. So make sure that they get that mission uh, messaging th throughout the site. Again, put it up first somewhere on the page and tell the stories your users really want to hear. Again, I, I bolded stories here. Stories are super important. Um, we have a session all about storytelling for um, impact because stories are what people really, that's the emotional hook. That's how they get their emotions fired up and want to give. So make sure storytelling is part of that. When you're thinking about what content belongs on your site in order to make people care, think about your visitors' top questions. Typically, this is what does this organization do, right? Uh, show who you are and whom you serve immediately. Make sure that your images convey the people that you serve as well. How are you making change? What impact are you having? Uh, go ahead and include a statement of the impact of your work. We're gonna do a little uh, test at the end and, and I'll show you an example of an organization doing this as well. And then how can I take action? Those calls to action are really important. And again, so make sure that they're there. Let's talk about hero messages. Hero messages are notoriously difficult to get right and they're so important. They're not necessarily a tagline. It's typically a short intriguing statement that captures the essence of what your organization does. I'll show you some good examples here in a moment, but they should be simple, concrete and compact. So nice and short, but pack a punch. Uh, don't get too flowery with it. Um, it can't be too ethereal or people don't 
really feel a connection to it. It's hard to feel much about something that's just flowery. So here's some great examples. This first one's from St. Baldrick's Foundation. Let's take childhood back from cancer. It says so much right there about what cancer does to childhood. And then you'll notice they have that donation form starting right below. This example from Boy Scouts of America, which is now called Scouts of America. This might be old. <laughs> Some kids avoid obstacles, Scouts overcome them. I absolutely love that. Um, it just says exactly who is part of the Scouts. And then you'll notice that join now button, the only thing in red, right there under their hero message. And then the last one from Boys and Girls Club of Metro Atlanta, great futures start here. Real short, real impactful. Uh, he looks like he's thinking about his future. So, and again, a beautifully designed site as well. On your website, um, there are things, a lot of times you'll see nonprofits will have something called a carousel, some people call it a slider. When you're on a site and you have a big image and it rotates between like five different images and it has little buttons you can check, that's what we're talking about. Those are called carousels. Uh, they lessen the emotional impact of your homepage's hero message. Um, a lot of times people say, should I have a carousel to, in order to answer the needs of all those people that want access to my homepage? So, you know, you've got an event coming up and that event person wants that on your homepage and you've got a new program and they want it on the homepage. So you, you kind of acquiesce to all of them. And, sorry, sure, we'll put it in a slider. Um, don't do it. <laughs> They're not good for your site. Uh, again, they just sort of, it's too much. People don't look at the ones, you know, beyond the first one. We know that the click-throughs drop off a cliff after they see that first one. Whatever's inside one is the thing that people see. So um, I wouldn't even bother having them. You're just going to have to do the hard work of telling people that doesn't work and that's, we're not going to do that. Okay, so what should be on the homepage? Number one, your hero message up front and center. Obvious calls to action, we've looked at that. Make sure, um, again, that the call to action on the homepage specifically is driving your overall website goal. Um, other departments will want their stuff and they can have their calls to action in their sections and the appropriate places of the site, but the homepage should be your number one driving priority goal. Make sure you have clear contact information. A lot of times this is in the footer. That's where people expect to find it. Make sure it's down there. Impact information. Um, so maybe it's a short stat. Don't overload people with stats. That doesn't lead to donations, but they do want a little bit of logic to back up their emotion, to validate their emotion. So, uh, you know, one stat or figure, a link to your annual report, um, some research you're doing, some, a new advocacy win, you know, something that shows impact could be important. And then social proof, testimonials, third-party endorsements. Uh, this might be if you've got a good charity navigator rating, things like that. Nick has great stats on this. Yes, so from a data perspective, we have been very curious to learn what is the optimal, optimal amount of time that a donor should be present on your website before they click that donate button and make a gift to your organization. And so as you can see on the slide, that optimal time frame is from about 10 seconds to 35 seconds. And that's where we see a peak conversion of about 35%. So that means somebody is entering their donation, or is viewing the website, entering the donation checkout and completing it. And a gift is made to the nonprofit. So where you can contextualize this with your website design and layout is to consider the types of content that will engage people for this amount of time. And notice that in the examples that we've looked at so far with Rachel, none of these hero messages and designs are text heavy. They're not causing you to read multiple paragraphs of text. They are setting forth very clear messages and images. And I think one of the best examples we've seen so far is with the ASPCA where they very clearly define what will be accomplished if you donate. It's if you do X, then Y will occur. And so in their case, they say 63 cents a day um, will help provide a animal with their first nourishing meal and save lives. So it's very clear what will happen when you donate. What you want to stay away from is content that is vague. And so if you just say, make a donation and you will change lives, it's not creating that moment of impact. And so someone might sit in front of their screen thinking about for more than 10 or 35 seconds what you mean. And similarly, 
if you place a five minute video on your hero section, if somebody is engaged for that amount of time, which typically they're not, you have about 90 seconds uh, with video to keep people engaged. Um, but if you're using content like that, or again, long blocks of text, there's a good chance that you will not land that sweet 10 to 35 second mark and see that 35% conversion rate. Great. Let's talk about how to keep it all moving. So we've talked about strategy and, and making audiences care. Um, now that we've got their attention, how do we keep them moving both in terms of first gives and ongoing gives? So we're going to start with forms and I'm going to focus on donation forms. I saw someone ask, what if your number one goal isn't fundraising? All the things I'm going to talk about are relevant no matter what you're not. So say your number one goal is fundraise or sorry, volunteering. Think of the CASAs, right? Volunteering is their number one goal. So I'm going to talk about donation forms. You would just shift in your mind and, and think she's talking about volunteer forms because the things I'm going to talk about are very much um, applicable across the board, regardless of your, assuming that you have some sort of form uh, and that's a conversion point for you. Um, and you gather people's either information or their money, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. All right. Your forms are really important. They are the connection between your organization and your donor's money. So we've got to be as simple as possible. And really, there's no more important, if your number one goal is fundraising, there's no more important uh, form on your page. Um, keep it as simple as possible. That means, you know, don't include phone numbers unless you're going to call them. Don't collect that information. Don't collect their title or their salutation unless you're going to use it in some form or fashion. Notice what the private sector is doing. When you're going and buying your winter coat, oh, we're a long way off from that in Austin, but I'm going to go buy a winter coat. 100 degree weather. <laughs> Maybe we're all a long way off from that at this point, <laughs> but when you're going to buy that, you know, notice as you go through that buying experience, what it's like. We know that those in the private sector are getting through their, their buying process 17 seconds faster than nonprofits are getting through the donation process. So what are they doing? Let's uh, use their big pockets and their research to further our needs as well. And then keep your research questions separate from the information you need for someone to donate become a member, renew, whatever your call to action looks like. So for example, if you wanna know their birthday because you know you wanna know their age, um, that is not information you need in order for them to donate. So I, well, I'll share with you one way to get that information later, um, but don't ask questions unless it's specifically related to the donation. This is an example um, from Salvation Army. Uh, what's great about this example is their site is just super simple. The donation form is super simple. You'll notice it has donate once, donate monthly buttons at the top. It's got do uh, dollar amounts there. Uh, we always recommend people start with the highest dollar amount um, that anchors people to give a little bit higher. And I know Nick's gonna share some data around how they use uh, machine learning to, to do that in a little bit different way. but. Um, Again, super easy to use. They've already got it selected for me. Donate once, donate 250. I can go change it. Or, you know, they kind of nudged me into um, potentially giving more if I was thinking about getting close to that. Multi-step forms can be really good for tracking. So if you have a form like this one where it's all, and it, it continues down the page, but it's all on one page. The nice thing for the users, it's super simple. I can get through it quickly. But if they abandon, anywhere in that donation form, you're going to know from your analytics that they started but never finished that donation and you won't know why. What's nice about multi-step forms is they allow you to kind of know where someone abandoned the donation. This is an example from Charity Water. If you ever want to see how to do something right, Charity Water is a great example for this. They are always testing and always improving. Um, you'll notice that they have monthly auto-selected. They have $40 auto-selected. Um, and this is the first thing you do is just simply think, fill out how much you're planning on giving and how often. And then it takes you to a page to get your, your card right away. So the, the next step after this one is your contact information. They do have to ask that, but they'll know somewhere along the way where you stopped. So if you stop, if you put in your card and didn't give you contact information, they know you that you abandoned there. I want to also call it the Express Donate. They do a great job of using the tools available to them. When you check that, um, when I selected it, I, it connected my, I was using Chrome and it connected to my credit card information right there. And I could just select the card. I didn't even have to fill out 
because I happen to have it connected. This does often, uh, not so much with Fundraise Up, but it does uh, uh, often include the need for custom development work. A lot of your out-of-the-box services won't really offer this option. So we talked quickly about nudges, and those are the psychological nudges that just kind of give people a little pause to think, oh, maybe I should do something a little differently. Um, so in this example, $35 is pre-selected. Um, and so that's that's a nudge. They're saying monthly giving at $35. Just by having those items pre-selected, they are nudging you toward that. My guess is their monthly donations are probably closer. Their average is probably about 25 or 30 bucks, and they're nudging a little higher. Okay. Um, and then you'll notice they also have this text. Most people are giving $35 monthly. Please give what you can. Again, a nudge is an example of um, just maybe pushing people a little bit higher. Nick, uh, do you want to talk about fundraise up and how you got you guys use uh, automated nudges? I love it. Absolutely, and these nudges are all important. And I, I think this is actually a really great example that you just showed before, Rachel, because it is both a nudge and social proof because you are demonstrating that other people like that donor are giving this particular amount. So it helps create that moment of trust for a donor who may not have given to your organization before. Something that we've done here at Fundraise Up with our approach to donation technology is to recognize that we're flawed as people. And more often than not, when we make a, a assumption or a decision based on what we believe to be true, quite often the data tells us we're wrong. So we've done away with making assumptions about how the donor experience should function and have instead shifted to, to, fun, uh, to um, function on a model that uses technology. And so we use artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us understand who your donors are and present them with an experience that is tailored, individualized to them. And one of the most obvious ways that we do this is with those suggested donation amounts, similar to what you see on the screen here. And a few moments ago, we talked about the order in which you show those donation amounts. And using AI right now for a majority of donors, it does make sense to show it from highest to lowest. But there may be a segment, there may be a persona where it needs to be remodeled and switched around so that it's lowest to highest or some mix in between the two. And instead of having to use people power to try and understand that again, we let the artificial intelligence learn this and adapt it for every donor. And so let's say that you are a donor going on to the Boys and Girls Club website to make a donation. And let's say they're using Fundraise Up. When you click that donate button, this pop-up donation form will appear on your screen. And those six suggested donation amounts you see there plus the input field below it with the donation amount will be completely customized to you. And the reason that's possible is because our AI is looking at a lot of, data, a lot of different data points to understand who you are. It's over 100, in fact. And those data points might include your geographic location based on your IP address. We might also look at the time of day, the device you're using, even the battery level of that device, because all of these factors impact which donation amounts are going to make the most sense for you. That's capital U, individual U, not just any generalized audience. And it works. We see over 50% of donors select an amount that has been essentially right-sized for them. Now, Here's something that is incredibly exciting for those of you who are focused on or wanting to focus in more on recurring giving. And we've touched a little on why it's important to look over the fence into the world of the for-profit world and e-commerce tech, where as Rachel noted, those checkout experiences happen 17 seconds quicker. And something that I'll note tangentially is that 17 seconds might not seem like a lot of time, but when we're talking about conversion, when we're talking about user experience, every millisecond, every click, every button, every color matters. And where we have looked over the fence into the world of e-commerce is to notice how 
during various checkouts that you might find on a department store's website, for example, you're upsold. You're asked to add things into your cart that maybe you didn't originally plan to purchase. This is, of course, very true when you go to rent a car online and you pick out your car, but then somehow you end up with the Sirius satellite radio uh, hookup and it's some insurances that maybe you didn't need, but you end up with them and those upsells work. And these same principles that encourage people to purchase more products can be applied for good. It can be applied to the nonprofit world where we can invite somebody to do more, to give more than they originally planned on. And so in this example, the donor started off with a one-time gift of $120. And using machine learning, we were able to pick out two different amounts that are monthly amounts for this donor and recommend them to them. And of course, either of these amounts, we have a $30 amount and a $25 amount on the screen right now, are of course significantly lower than that $120 one-time gift. But over the course of say 12 months, it's a much greater gift. And as I mentioned earlier, this also has a profoundly positive impact on donor retention and donor lifetime value. And through this approach, we've seen a majority of our nonprofit customers um, move to see a three times growth in the recurring donor acquisition rate. So it's really powerful technology that can be leveraged for good, influenced by e-commerce in the for-profit world and translated into the work that all of you do in the nonprofit space. Now, one of the things that Rachel mentioned earlier, and we highlighted with some of the examples from say Charity Water, for example, are what are known as express wallet payment methods. Um, and you, you recognize these, they're fairly synonymous with purchasing experiences at Starbucks and other stores that you're familiar with. But before I highlight those payment methods, I do wanna talk a little bit about the ability to cover costs. And I know this came up in the Q&A and I think I saw some uh, text about it in the chat as well. And this has traditionally been a fairly taboo subject in the nonprofit space. A lot of people seem to believe that we shouldn't ask donors to cover costs. And we saw this so often out in the space, you know, in forums, in comments on LinkedIn posts, that we wanted to put it to the test. And our research found that a majority of donors do want to cover transaction costs. In fact, 92% of them will if you let them. And if they cover those costs on first donations, they're likely to give more in the future and they're likely to continue covering those costs. So it's really important to allow your donors to do that, but you also have to set it up right. And so we see a lot of other donation forms in the space where the option to cover costs has been buried at the bottom of the form. It's in small text and it doesn't engage the donor. And so we've taken a different approach here by putting it front and center, even highlighting it with some stars. And that's how we see that type of performance where 92% of donors cover transaction costs. And now I will uh, chat for a moment about these express wallet payment methods. These are incredibly important. And if you don't have them enabled today, do it. And it's no longer difficult to do this. You don't necessarily need to have your own Apple developer account, your own Google developer account. Platforms like ours and many others in the space offer this as a turnkey solution. And it's important because PayPal example is a payment method that's selected by 20% of donors at checkout. And in fact, just by showing the PayPal logo during checkout, that button, you can increase conversion by up to 7%. And then other payment methods such as instant ACH, the ability for somebody to automatically give from their bank account are highly important, not because a lot of donors will use them, but because donors who seek to give significant gifts use it as the vessel through which they give. So between covering costs and allowing donors to use express wallet payment methods, you see several bumps in conversion, which doesn't just translate to a few more dollars, for your mission, it can oftentimes translate for many customers into millions of dollars. Uh, yes, A-B tests. So if you're not familiar with the concept of A-B tests, this is the practice of taking your 
control solution. So let's say that's your pre-existing donation form and testing it against a control form. So in this case, with the example you see on the screen, this would be against Fundraise Up. And the reason we engage in these tests is to confirm for many customers who are coming to the Fundraise Up universe that what we say is true. And so we have the data that tells us why AI and machine learning can increase your conversion, but it's also something that we have to prove in practice. And so one of the things that I'll highlight in this test, and I've highlighted them with a set of arrows in that second screenshot to the right, is that oftentimes when we test against control solutions, we see dips in some areas, such as average and median size gift. And this is a good conversation for all of us to have because these aren't always good metrics to use, average and median, when determining whether some change you've made in your own form is, is a good change to have made or whether the new solution you're looking at is a good solution. Because in our case, that median and average gift size is decreasing because we're using AI to right size the donation amount for a given donor. And so they might give a little less than the static amount had invited them to in the control form, but because we're using dynamic numbers, they select that and the conversion is increased. And so you'll see that in this case, if you look at the very bottom line here and it's highlighted in yellow, the overall revenue increased by using this type of technology. And so again, it's important to determine for your organization, what is a win? And that win should 10 out of 10 times be how much more money was received for our mission rather than what was the average gift size or what was the median gift size. Now, one of the things that we can recognize from a lot of modern e-commerce websites is that they give us a lot of control over our relationship with the vendor, the online shop. We can access our account, we can view tracking information, download receipts, etc. But for many nonprofits, there's not a good way to do this. And so this means donors are picking up the phone to call your staff, they're writing emails to you. And this ends up taking up administrative time, managerial time that perhaps you could have otherwise allocated to fundraising, being out on the road, going door to door with your donors in non-COVID times, of course. And so one of the features that we've implemented in our own platform is what we call Donor Portal. And this is a self-service dashboard for donors where they can access their recurring plans, they can download previous receipts, they can make tribute gifts, they can start and manage P2P fundraisers, all without having to pick up the phone and call your team, all without having to write an email to somebody and end up in this back and forth conversation. And why this is especially important for your recurring donors is because there may be times when a recurring donor might need to adjust their gift. In fact, some donors might believe that they need to cancel their gift. And when they log into Donor Portal, they can certainly do that, but we'll actually provide them with some alternatives that are designed to reduce attrition. So if I'm a donor and I enter Donor Portal with the intention of canceling my gift, I'll first be presented with a couple of alternatives. I can put my recurring plan on pause, or I could simply adjust the amount of my gift. So if I was giving $25 and I no longer felt I was able to support that gift to the nonprofit, I can modify it to be maybe $10 or $5. And again, this all wraps into the value that you provide to your donors, the trust that they are able to build with your nonprofit, and certainly adds in to their desire to continue giving to your organization. Great. So they've given. That's the great news. Yay. Okay. Um, so once they've given, um, they're going to get a thank you page from your organization. For a lot of you right now, what that looks like is thanks for your donation. Look at your inbox for a receipt. And that's it. But that's not what your thank you page should be doing. It should be making people feel better about the donation that they just made. They feel great right when they've made that donation. We want to continue that good feeling give them celebration. If you're able, say thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Nick. Use their name. You have that from your previous form. Um, and let them know how their contribution is making a difference. Right now, your thank you page may be an exit page. People go and then they see they need to go check their inbox and they leave your site. 
we want to continue them on the site. We want them, this is a good opportunity to share some video with them or get them thinking more about your organization and, and, the, and the contribution they just made. Um, one other thing that's great for thank you pages is to get that data that you didn't want to collect in the form. So for example, if you want to know what their birthday is or their gender for some reason or their highest level of education or what program they like or what, how often they want to be communicated with, all those things that allow you to speak to them specifically later about their interest um, can be asked here on the thank you page. And Rachel, mm -hmm. here's a, a really exciting way to use that thank you page and, and really put it to work. And so we talked a little bit about how you can upsell donors, but you can also upsell them through that thank you page. And so once somebody has completed a donation, you can thank them and you can also invite them to either move to become a monthly donor, or if they gave a one-time gift, you might invite them to give that same gift again at the same time next year. And it's just a simple yes or no question for the donor. And if they say yes, you already have what's known as their tokenized payment method on file. And so you're able to lock that up and put it on file without the donor needing to donor needing to re-enter their payment details at checkout. And so this can work for recurring giving on a monthly basis, an annual basis, or in some cases you might even upsell someone to start a P2P fundraiser. Great. I'm going to move through these last few pretty quickly here, but a couple of things you can do to today to improve your website. Now we've looked at lots of things you can do. You can want to hear a message, etc. But um, today, one thing is to give it the five-second test. So um, the five-second test basically you have five seconds, and it should, your site should be able to answer these questions in those five seconds. What? Is, why does the org exist? How do they impact the world? And how can I take action? I'm going to give you a, a site for five seconds, and then ask yourself these questions. Why do they exist, their impact? How do I take action? Okay, here we go. Of course, that's St. Jude's. And again, the question is why do they exist? How do they impact and what's the action? Why do they exist? They're finding cures to save children. How do they impact the world? You'll notice they've got their research right there um, in the middle bottom. And then the take action, the donate now button is clear in two different places. So they're doing a good job with those five seconds. Five second rule is just sort of a general rule. You have somewhere between five and eight seconds to get people's attention generally. So make sure you're making it worth it. How do you do that? You want to um, show your page for five seconds, get, get some volunteers, ideally some donors or potential donors, show them the page for five seconds cover up the page and have them write down what they remember. Um, and then do they articulate the purpose of the page as listed in your web page spreadsheet, right? So are they telling you, oh, they save lives by finding cures? Are they, are they giving you some of this information back? A couple other quick and easy updates. Make your phone numbers tappable on mobile. That's super easy, but a lot of times people don't do that. Make sure you're included descriptive links for those with disabilities. And say of saying read more, you might say read more about our blank program or something. Just give them some indication of what's behind the link. Move your social icons to the footer. Nobody's clicking those. I guarantee you. Check your analytics, but my guess is they're not, don't, they're taking up too much real estate at the top of the page. Simplify your donation form. Don't require a phone number. Um, you know, is a mailing address required? Is that really necessary? Uh, Nick, you had something about that? Absolutely. And I'll happily share one of our blog posts with everyone as well. But mailing addresses aren't required anymore for many platforms to accept a donation. And so if you don't need it, don't ask for it because it can drop your conversion by up to 18%. 18%. Yeah, that's huge. Big percentage. And improve your thank you page. I want to make sure we're going to get to a couple of questions here, so I'm not going to go too much into the recap. Um, we do have um, slides and a website evaluation kit available at mightycitizen.com slash anatomy. Um, so if you go there, you're going to get a few things, including a nonprofit website performance guide and a um, how to plan and execute a fundraising campaign guide, um, along with the slides today. Uh, Bree, do we have questions? Hi, yes, we have so many questions. Oh and, my gosh, and it's two o'clock. Yeah, so if, if everyone, uh, people are still interested, we'll try to answer a few um, or as quickly as we can get. Let me just put in the chat that link really quickly. 
Yeah. And if There's you have to jump of, off, there's you a ask lot of really good questions in here. Sorry. I know. To, yeah, to, I know. I mean, are incredible. We'll have the recording. We'll answer them here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can come back. Okay. Uh, Justin is asking, what are your thoughts on videos on the homepage as compared to a singular still image and or slider? I bet you've got some info on that, Nick. Yes, I do. And I'm actually going to reference a study by Next After, uh, where they looked at this specifically on the donation page. Um, and so it's important to note that as a differentiator, but video on a donation page is not necessarily a good thing because you might run into issues where either the length is too long and so somebody becomes disinter disinterested and closes out of the page. Perhaps the video causes the web page to not load at all because it's being loaded from an external source or other issues like that. So on the donation page itself, where you have your donation form, we typically recommend that you don't include video. And similarly, in your hero section, you can run into some, some of those same problems. And especially if you look at this from the perspective of those seconds really matter, if your video takes too long to load on the page or causes the page itself to load slower, somebody might become just in, disinterested and leave the page. So typically, I would avoid having video unless it meets that marker of, you know, just 10, 15, maybe 30 seconds, um, leave the video for other places on your website where donors can find it. Okay, great, thanks. All right, another question is, can our call to action shift throughout the year? Yes, definitely. So if you're running a particular campaign, say you're running a volunteering campaign, you wanna get a certain number of volunteers before school starts or something like that. Most definitely you can change up your messaging and your calls to action on your homepage and throughout your site um, with whatever you've got as priority at that time. So if it's really about whether your priorities shift throughout the year. Okay, great. All right, next question. Is it enough to just have a donate button on each page that opens to a donation page and subsequent form for the actual donation? Would we be better off using a platform versus Stripe? That's, really, <laughs> that's a really good question. And this is a lot of a lot of times a typical flow for donation form is you click the donate button on the main home page, it takes you into another page where you then click another button, and then you get to the form. But our research has showed that every time somebody clicks through to another page to get to that donation form, your conversion starts to drop by about 10% every time. And so if somebody clicks three times and that's 10 times three, that's potentially a loss of 30% in conversion. So where possible, limit the click through that's required for somebody to make a gift. And so that's why with our own platform, when somebody clicks donate on a nonprofit's website, it's going to launch that donation experience on that same page as a pop-up, otherwise known as a modal. Yeah, and you see that more and more and more more places are putting the donation form right there on the homepage. All right. All right. This is a good question for Nick. Is it a good idea to make the credit card fees mandatory for the donor to pay? <laughs> That's a very good question. And it is okay to allow somebody to cover the cost. I would say in most cases, you shouldn't force a donor into covering those costs. But if you pre-check the box for them by default, it's a great way for them to continue to opt in to covering those costs on that donation and subsequent donations. Uh, someone asking to talk a little bit more about call to action. We have two equally important pieces, donate and advocate. How do we present that or do we just choose one? Uh, always choose one if you can. <laughs> that would be number one. Uh, the other uh, thing I would say is go back and look uh, when the slides come, look at the CASA page, they chose volunteer. And the only reason you know that is because it's in the main header, but they had two call to actions of equal importance in the top right. So you can put two call to actions, you know, in the on the same page of equal footing, but you have to give one of them some sort of priority. And they did a good job with that, I thought. And I actually had this thought earlier in the presentation, because I think I saw this very question. If you have to have those two call to actions in the same place, style them differently. So one might be styled as a button and one might be styled as a plain text link. And that way somebody can differentiate between the two and they're not holding exactly the same weight. Okay, great. 
Um, let's see, someone is saying, is this AI and machine learning part of Google Analytics or plugins that we can buy and load on our website or part of your service? Good question. And more and more, there are plugins for WordPress, plugins for other website platforms that you can use to help accomplish some of this. But what I would recommend is to find a platform, whether it's Fundraise Up or some other platform, that is able to do this more broadly. Because without one platform to look at many facets of the donor's experience, then you only get bits and pieces of the picture. And so, for example, with our platform, we are looking at the donor as they start visiting the website, as they look at various pages on the website, and certainly as they go on to make a donation. So it's important to see that full picture. Otherwise, you're going to end up with bits and pieces of data that make it difficult to make a, a good decision. Um, I'm not sure, Rachel, you might know something like this, but do you know of a questionnaire tool that walks you through the strategic thinking side that can be filled out by multiple resources before you start the design slash contact phase? Okay, so we actually have something called um, the technology website technology planner. That's going to cover a lot of your tech stuff. And then we also have a website evaluation kit, which I think will help with some of the design and development stuff. Um, Bree, I don't know if you can find that thing. Yeah, you're... what I'm what I'm gonna do because it's it's quick. Um, since I'm trying to get to the questions, I'm gonna uh, slash tools. I just put in mightycitizen.com slash tools. So if you type in website evaluation uh, kit or the in the technology kit, you should be able to technology find. planner website technology. Yeah, and um, if I make a mental note, I'll include that in the email as well. Uh, okay, do we just want a few more questions? Um, There's one Brie in there that I saw that mm -hmm. was about donor portal. Would you mind if I tackle that one quickly? Yeah, doesn't donor portal contradict the don't make them create an account rule? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is a very valid point. The difference is in how you do it. So if you ask a donor to create an account up front when they're trying to make a donation, that's a problem and your conversion is going to disappear. It's okay to ask them to do that after they've made a donation. And where we take it a step further with our own platform is you don't actually have to create an account where you have a username and password. You log in using your email. And so what you do is you have a magic link. And every time you click that magic link will authenticate you into your donor portal without username or password. And you'll be able to manage things that way because the last thing any of us wanna do in this day and age is have another set of usernames and passwords to manage something. Right, okay. How do you see where the individual ab abandon on the form? Is this within the website or within the third party embed form? That's a very good question. Earlier in the presentation, Rachel highlighted the benefits of a multi-step form where with a static one-page form, you don't get this data. And the secret tool here is JavaScript events. And so in a multi-step form, JavaScript is being fired to signal various events. And so as somebody clicks a button, that logs a bit of data. And as they move through various views, that's logging more data. And certainly when they click that final button in the checkout, their final conversion is being logged as well. So JavaScript is the, uh, the secret sauce there. All right, I'm gonna do one more question since it's uh, the 10 minute mark over. Uh, do you recommend to create a donor centric website separated of the main website? If so, in what cases? No. <laughs> <laughs> Simply no. Um, I would say, I mean, you want all of your main content living on one site for many reasons, SEO being one of them. Um, but also um, you can use landing pages for don't for specific campaigns. So say you're running a back to school campaign for something. You can have a, a landing page, which is one page on the site that's specifically for that campaign full of beautiful donor language and not have it have to have its own site. Really, you, you shouldn't have enough content um, to have a whole separate site for fundraising. You know, it's like this. Once they get to like looking at your donate page, there's not a lot to say. <laughs> and it's an easy mistake to make. I will include 
having been a young designer at one point in my life, I made the same mistake of thinking, oh, well, it'd be easier if I just spin up a separate website altogether to manage all of the giving. Well, we know the intended, the intent, but the result is confusion, reduced conversion. And as Rachel noted, it's not necessarily good for SEO either. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel and Nick. Uh, this was great. Everyone uh, seemed to really enjoy the session. We're getting lots of great feedback. Uh, just as a reminder, we're sending out the slides and the recording of the webinar to everyone who registered. Uh, when you exit, um, you'll be taken to a post webinar survey. Um, we hope you'll just take a few minutes to tell us what you think. Uh, we take our audience feedback really seriously and we work to improve and update uh, our future webinars and content topics based off of that feedback. Uh, if you have any additional questions, um, you can reach out to Nick or Rachel. Um, Rachel, I don't know if you can go back yep. <laughs> slide with, your e with the emails um, if you want to further uh, the conversation. Uh, again, thanks again. Thanks for attending. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you.